So first of all, I'd like to welcome you all very much. This is the first event that is being run by the new board that took over uh, in July this year. And we're running three pre-Rosh Hashanah events. This is the first of them. We'll put the details of the others in the chat. And so you'll be able to link and join into those uh, afterwards as well. So let me begin by acknowledging the, the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation, who are the indigenous owners of the land in Melbourne, where I am based, and to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, all the lands on which we're meeting across Australia. Given the incredible uprisings we've had in Israel with respect to sexual violence, I thought it was apposite to also acknowledge survivors of sexual violence tonight and to recognise that those of us who've been fortunate enough to have uh, not had the terrible experience that so many women have uh, should stand in solidarity with our sisters wherever in the world they are when they are treated uh, with total disrespect and uh, humiliated and treated with a lack of dignity. As we reach and move towards Rosh Hashanah to the Jewish New Year, we think about what's happened to us in our lives and we do a reckoning about what we've done and what we've been through in the course of the year. And 2020 is a very unusual year. I think that you will all agree. I'm in Melbourne in stage four lockdown. We're going to have very, very different experiences of all the Chagim this year than we've ever had before. And therefore, we thought at National Council that it was very important that we talked a little bit and learnt a little bit about how to touch base with ourselves, with our spirits for Rosh Hashanah. And we're greatly honoured to have three incredible women with us tonight. They're all homegrown Australian rabbis who've got smicha from different sorts of uh, institutions. And they can tell you if they want to any more about that, but we've got quite a lot of detail about them on, uh, we've had posts on the website, uh, on Facebook and on the website about them, so you can read full details about each of them. I'm going to introduce very briefly each speaker as they go uh, ahead and, in, and run their session. So we've got three sessions. We've got the chat enabled, so if you'd like to ask a question, please put it in the chat. But we will be staying along over and beyond this at the end of the event. We'll be finishing the event just after nine o'clock when we've finished each of the speakers. But everybody's welcome to stay on for, to continue the conversation for a period of time after that. So uh, please respond if, uh, if the speakers ask you to. Otherwise, put questions in the chat and we'll try and deal with them. But if we don't deal with them straight away, we'll have an opportunity to do that afterwards. So our first speaker this evening is Rabbi Shoshana Kiminsky. Rabbi Shoshana comes from South Australia, from Adelaide, and she's the rabbi of the Beit Shalom Synagogue there and is the treasurer of the Assembly of Rabbis and Cantors of Australia, New Zealand and Asia. Her topic tonight is Sarah, Hagar and Women's Resilience. And I think, therefore, I should just hand over to Rabbi Shoshana. Hello. Yes, I'm here. You're... Well, I can't see you. You must be oh, somewhere. Yes. Um, ah, there you are. There, there I am. Yes, yes. I, can I just say, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted that you've referred to me as a homegrown rabbi. Um, so clearly I have lost my accent enough to, uh, to, be, uh, to be convincing as an, as an Australian. So that's, that's very exciting. Um, so, uh, and uh, it's wonderful to, uh, to be here this evening with all of you uh, from from around Australia, uh, and as is typical, I think I have I've I've got 15 minutes and about an hour and a half worth of material. Um, I'm going to put in the chat here um, the uh, the um, resource page that I've prepared on Safaria, so that you can refer back to it when I run out of time. And I might even ask that you sort of keep me um keep me on my my time so I don't have to keep looking at the uh, at the clock. Um, and so I was reflecting on the, the subject of resilience, uh, and, uh, and, and this comes out of my own personal experience of, of really having had quite a fortunate life 
and not really ever having experienced anything quite like what this, these last number of months have been in terms of feeling that I had, have had periods where life has been taken out of my control. Uh, and it made me reflect back on the fact that this is actually a relatively novel for us Jews to have had an extended period of time, in my case, just about my entire life, when my life has been under my control and I haven't been subject to the whims of the government of the time, of the levels of anti-Semitism, of famine, of all of the different, uh, different fates that could have befallen me. And so I thought that I would take this time to look back um, specifically at uh, two women who play a prominent part in Rosh Hashanah, and that's Sarah and Hagar. And, uh, and, so, that, and so we uh, traditionally we read from Genesis chapter 21 on the first day of Rosh Hashanah. It's actually quite a confronting for a reading. It starts out beautifully. With the, uh, with the birth of Yitzchak, when Sarah is already 90 years old, and she names him uh, Laughter, because it's, it's hysterically funny to be 90 years old and have a baby, uh, which most of us could imagine how funny that would be. Uh, and, uh, and, but, but, but what happens in the story is, that, um, is that, that Sarah and Hagar are essentially pitted against each other. And can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. So Sarah and Hagar are, are pitted against each other. And that's because um, as Sarah, even though she, she's part of this very, very wealthy family, the tradition of the land is that, um, is that if, you, if you die without a son, if, yours, if your husband dies and you don't have a son, then you will be left destitute with no one to support you. So it's very important to her that she has a son. And then it becomes important to her that there is an older son, who is Yishmael, who was uh, born before Yitzchak. And so it, she now sees her status as threatened by this older son who will stand to inherit the, le the lion's share of Abraham's estate when he dies. And so she goes to um, Abraham and she insists that he throw out Ishmael and his mother, Hagar, so that Ishmael won't share the inheritance with her. Uh, and if you if you hang around with me long enough, you're going to hear me talk about Hagar, uh, because I think she's an extraordinary woman in the Torah. Her name Hagar literally means the stranger, and she is she is the most vulnerable person in the society. She's vulnerable because she is a foreigner. She's always de described as the Egyptian. She's a woman, and she's a slave. Uh, and and we uh, and the what happens in chapter twenty one follows on from an earlier episode in which she's also she's got a fourth area of vulnerability which is that she's pregnant uh, and she runs away and she finds herself in in the wilderness and has this amazing visitation with an angel uh, and it's terribly sad to me that these two powerful women are pitted against each other in the story with the sense that only one of them can have the sun who prevails. I'm gonna share my screen with you now and take you to the worksheet, to the, uh, the sheet that I've prepared. And so let me scroll back up. And so this is the, the um, so this is uh, the, the latter half of chapter 21, uh, which is the, the Torah reading for Rosh Hashanah. And in verse nine, it says, Sarah saw the son whom Agar the Egyptian had born to Abraham playing. She said to Abraham, cast out that slave woman and her son, but the son of that slave, she doesn't even have a name here, shall not share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly for it concerned a son of his, but God said to Abraham, do not be distressed over the boy or your slave. Whatever Sarah tells you to do, tells you, do as she says. For it is through Isaac that offspring shall be continued for her. And we have this fantastic note in Rashi. I'm going to scroll down uh, to his, his note on this, on this idea where Abraham is instructed to hearken unto her voice, Shema Bukala, and Rashi comments, we may infer that Abraham was inferior to Sarah in respect of prophecy. So in other words, in this particular situation, Sarah is the one who actually knows what God's intent is. 
God is, God's intent is that Isaac is going to be the one who carries on the line. And Sarah has access to that knowledge in a way that Abraham doesn't. And in um, Midrash Rabbin, Breshit Rabbah, which is the next text on the page, uh, it, um, it greatly expands on this idea of Sarah's power of prophecy. So, and you will remember that before her name is Sarah, her name is Sarai. So rather than her name ending with a hey, it ends with a yud. God said, Sarai, your wife. In Proverbs, it is written, a woman of valor is a crown to her husband. Rabbi Acha said, her husband was crowned through her but she was not crowned through her husband. Our rabbis taught that she ruled over her husband. In all places, a man gives orders, but here it says, in all that Sarah orders, you listen to her voice. So she is the one who has the, the, the voice of authority in this particular case. And then said Rabbi Yehoshua ben Korcha, the yud that the Holy One of Blessing took from Sarai was given half to Sarah and half to Abraham. So both of them have their names changed at the same moment. So Sarai has that yud taken away and it's replaced with a hay. And Avram, his name is expanded and a hay is added to the, onto that. And so his name becomes Abraham. So half of that yud goes to Sarah and half goes to Abraham. Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai, the yud that the Holy One of Blessing took from Sarai flew and posted itself in front of the throne of the Holy One and said, Master of the universe, because I am the smallest letter, you took me out of the name of Sarai, the righteous. The Holy One said, in the past you were in the name of a woman and in the end of the name. Now I will put you in the name of a man. And on the beginning of the name, as it is written in Moshe called Hosea ben Nun Yehoshua. So in other words, Hosea, who becomes Joshua, Yehoshua, has the yud tacked on to the beginning of his name. And it's that yud that was taken away from Sarai. So this is different, different traditions, but all of which affirm Sarah as this, this woman of power and authority in this story. Um, but, uh, but of course, it, 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 the life proves very, very different, difficult for Hagar. I'm going to scroll back to the story. And so, so yes, so um, Abraham throws them out. Uh, so this is verse 14. Early next morning, Abraham took some bread and a skin of water and gave them to Hathar. He placed them over her shoulder together with the child and sent her away. And she wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. And then the water was gone from the skin, no more water. She left the child under one of the bushes and went and sat down at a distant a bow shot away, for she thought, let me not look on as the child dies. So at this moment, the only power that she has is to distance herself so that she doesn't have to watch her son die. And sitting thus afar, she burst into tears. And God heard the cry of the boy, didn't her hear her cry, but heard the cry of the boy. And an angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what troubles you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heeded the cry of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him by the hand, for I will make a great nation of him. And then God opened her eyes as if she were blind, and suddenly she could see, and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and let the boy drink. And so the story, which has this, this panicky moment, what will happen to her, what will happen to, the, to Yishmael, it all works out okay. But it is a, a really, really terrifying moment. But I would suggest that at this point, Hagar has already learned that God is going to look after her. Because I mentioned earlier that we have this extraordinary encounter in, uh, earlier in Genesis chapter 16, and that's further down on the page. And again, if you've joined us since I started talking, um, I'll let you know that there is a link to this page in the chat. So you can, um, you can link on to the, the source sheet for Safaria. So this is, um, so Hagar has to run away. She's become pregnant. Her mistress, who's still named Sarai, um, has not been able to have children. And she becomes very, very upset and jealous. And Hagar runs away. And an angel of, of 
the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the road to shore, and said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? And then again, she's defined her status as a slave, defines her, and she doesn't know where she's going. All she can say is, I'm running away from my mistress Sarai. And the angel of Adonai said to her, go back to your mistress and submit to her heart's treatment. The angel of the Lord then gives her this promise and says, I will greatly increase your offspring. They shall be too many to count. This is how she knows that Ishmael is going to survive. The angel of the Lord said to her further, behold, you are with child and you shall bear a son. You shall call him Ishmael, God heard, for the Lord has paid heed to your suffering. And he's going to be a challenging boy. He shall be a wild ass of a man, his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him. He shall dwell alongside all of his kinsmen. And then Hagar does something quite extraordinary. She gives God a new name. She called the Lord who she spoke to her, you are El Roi, by which she meant, have I not gone on seeing after God saw me? And in my checks, I believe that she's the only person in the Tanakh who gives God a name. God gives people names. We just read about how God renamed Hosea Yehoshua. God named Sarai Sarah. But here, Hagar, the slave, the Egyptian, uh, the woman gives God a new name and says, I'm going to call you the God who see, sees because you've seen me. And, uh, and the rabbis, this is typical for me. They don't usually have the same questions about the text that I do. And so I came across this, um, this piece from Sforno, um, his commentary, where he says that when, when it says, Batikha Shem Hashem, she called God. The meaning is that it was a prayer. She prayed. She didn't give God a new name. She said a prayer. It refers to the kind of prayer in which one praises the Lord or thanks God. This prayer may be offered silently in one's mind or with words. And so it may look like she actually gave God a new name, but she didn't. She was, it was a particular style of prayer. And then I think I've just got a couple of minutes, maybe a minute left. So um, I'm going to read through this. Uh, this is a longer midrash. This is from Tan, Midrash Tan Huma. Um, and, uh, and this, you know, and this answers the question, what did Hagar do, you know, in this moment? And, um, and, this is on, um, and this is taking us back to, to the previous uh, section, to Genesis 21. When the water in the flask was consumed and Ishmael was about to die of thirst, she placed the child beneath one of the bushes, and the word for bush, bushes is sikhim. And Rabbi Meir says, it's when the bush we're talking about is one of the large shrubs that grow in the desert. But Rabbi Yossi, the son of Halafta, said it was the place at which the angel had Spoken, Latsuach had engaged her in conversation previously, the same place where she had met the angel, where we already know there's a well of water. And Rabbi Berechia declared it indicates that she reproached the omnipotent one there harshly. She told God off. He said, Is it possible, master of the universe, that you are like an ordinary human being who gives a gift and then withdraws it? Did you not tell me your seed will multiply exceedingly? Yet now my son is about to perish from thirst. So there's no possible way that you could have made this promise to me if you did not intend to keep it. And the Holy One, blessed be he, thereupon commanded the angel to disclose the well to her. It was only at that moment. Was it the intention that she and her son die of thirst? Only at that moment is she, is she able to see the well. And then it goes on, I'm not going to read this part, to say that Ishmael, as we already know, he's going to be a bit of a handful when he grows up. Why is it that he would be taken care of if we know he's going to, to bring some difficulties to the Jewish people? And God says, um, it is because God heard the voice of the lad where he was, meaning who he was at that time, before he grew into what he was going to be. And so, you know, we have both in Sarah and in Hagar, this incredible strength um, in difficult circumstances, circumstances where they struggled to, to regain control. 
And so I provide this to you as a source of inspiration in this time when our lives are at times completely out of our control, when we have to trust in others, when we have to, to hope that everything is going to work out. And, and as we enter into this season, not quite clear what the future brings, but we know that, um, that we have this, this, this extraordinary legacy of women who have stayed strong and resilient through it. So, and that's where I'll stop. Thank you very, very much, uh, Rabbi Kaminsky. The thing that I think you said that's particularly important or for me to carry away is the role of prayer and the way that we can craft a prayer that's appropriate to our situation. That seems to me what uh, uh, Hagar was doing there. Uh, quite, and that's quite an extraordinary thing and a very powerful thing for us to be able to do. Um, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions, as I said, and to continue the conversation with uh, Shoshana, with Rabbi Shoshana afterwards. We're now going to move on to uh, uh, Rabbi, Dr. Melanie Landau. Um, Melanie is an avid lover of life, an explorer of love. She was born and raised in Melbourne, Victoria. She's had 20 years experience guiding individuals and groups in for transformative processes and cultivating the sacred. She has specializations in deep listening, conflict transformation, embodied awareness, and thriving with complex trauma in particularly, particular transforming relational wounds and addictive patterns. She's going to be talking to us about one line of the liturgy to explore connecting to ourselves and feeling part of a larger whole. I give you Dr. Melanie Rubber Landau. Hi, everyone. It's really, really good to be here. Thank you for having me. I feel so moved to be with all of you. And um, yeah, it's a really good opportunity. Thank you, um, Rabbi Shoshana, for your words and the inspiration of um, women's resilience who came before us. Also, Melinda, I, I want to say that I felt so, as well as just really taking, be, I'm sitting here in Jerusalem um, in the afternoon, and um, as well as taking in um, your, uh, well, your acknowledgement of, of country and also acknowledgement of um, survivors of sexual violence, I just felt very touched. And, um, and also, with, um, just linking that to what Rabbi Shoshana was saying about, um, I, I'm, in a moment I want to take us to one line of liturgy and, and sort of like go inside it, but... It's also a general invitation to connect, like, what is our prayer at this moment? Like, connecting into, you know, what's alive for us and what might our prayer be? And if some of you have some um, things come up about what your prayer might be in this moment, you could feel free to write it in the chat box. And also, um, if there's anything as I'm speaking, if you want to make a comment or ask a question, also feel free to write in the chat box. Because for me... I've got things that I want to say, but I would also like to be a bit interactive with you as I'm going, if that's possible. Um, so I think also I'd want to want to get us to start with, I really like the touching, what's the title? I really like the title of this that includes spirit and base. <laughs> and, um, and it feels to me like bringing together heaven and earth, bringing together ourselves as material and spiritual beings and I want us to and how and I think the core of how that happens is through our breath bringing our breath into our body and so I want to take us to take a moment to feel our body and to take a breath if you feel comfortable to you know feel your feet on the ground close your eyes you can do that you don't have to we're all breathing <laughs> so we can just like um if we can like put just a, attention on a few breaths and, and also feel our heart area. And take in, you know, take in this being that is ourself coming to, to um, you know, towards Rosh Hashanah, towards, you know, ultimate questions um, around, around life and our purpose. And also take in that we're, we're with all you know, all of us are here in this moment together, um, just taking that into our systems and noticing what that might feel like. Uh, oh, just before I, I also um, 
move on to the, to the line of prayer that I want to say, it also feels really significant for me to connect to home. Like, I, um, you know, Melbourne, but Australia, and there's something about that, that whatever our home is, that there's something about um, connecting to our purpose Rosh Hashanah, it's like the birth of the world, the celebration of the birth of the world. So when we come back to the beginnings, we're like, well, what's the purpose? And we get this chance every year to come back and revisit, like, you know, what, what is our purpose? And part of connecting to our purpose is whatever has happened and however far we've gone, like we need something about our home or our origins, we bring them with us. We need them with us for our own resilience. And so it feels particularly significant for me to, to be with all of you in Australia. So in, in, the, um, in the prayer of Rosh Hashanah, we keep repeating this refrain. I'll say it in Hebrew and then in English, and I'm going to go through each kind of like section. Zachreinu lechaim, melech hafetz b'chaim, bekatveinu besefer hachaim, lemancha Elohim chaim. So it's like, remember us for life. The king, the one who loves, who desires life. Write us in the book of life for your sake, the living God. So it's like living and it's life. And, and if it was so straightforward, like to choose life, we wouldn't be need to repeat it in so many different ways. And I think now at this time of, of COVID, there's a way in which maybe, you know, different challenges have come up and people are meeting different challenges on many, many different levels. And, and my experience um, with speaking to people is that it has exposed some of, the, some of the real challenges that maybe in the usual way without, um, you know, COVID are, are, are more maybe in the background. So, Zachreinu Lachayim. Rem remember us, like remember us to life, remind us to life so we remember ourselves. It's almost like we're invoking, we need a witness to life and to love. And so, and that's a question for me, like what, what, what life have we been witness to? And it's a bit related to also gratitude, like what, and sometimes maybe we could take it for granted, even the simple things. And I don't know about your mind, but sometimes my mind could go to the negative things. But there's so much life every moment that we're also witness to. And I want to share actually a moment of life um, and love that I was witness to today. And I've been privileged living in, in Jerusalem and doing work around the conflict. And because I haven't taken citizenship here um, yet, I've been able to travel between um, Israel and Palestinian territories. And so, and um, bringing also Jewish leaders to listen to Palestinians. And today, not in outside of the framework of the work, I introduced my friend who um, lives in a Jewish community in the Green Line to the neighbouring head of the village. Um, and it was just this morning I came back from there and something about, like for me, it's not, it's like I can easily move between it. I don't have anything to lose. Um, and, but for both of, of these people, you know, there's different challenges that they have and to witness them wanting to to speak to each other, wanting to build that bridge, wanting to connect was so moving, you know, and there's so many different ways that that happens, that we can get outside of different paradigms, different boxes and really connect with each other. So, Zachreen Lechayim, how, you know, what life are we witness to? Um, then um, I want to move to Melech um, Hafetz Bachayim. Also, I want to invite you, if there's any prayers like for yourself or for other people that emerge, I invite you to write it in the chat box or also if there's any comments or questions, I would love you to write it because I, it's good for me to feel that we're like, it's not just a one way street right now. So feel free. <laughs> um, okay. Melech um, Chafetz uh, Even up, that's, um, that's the king who, who loves life, who desires life. So it's like even when we don't remember, even if things are challenging and it's hard for us to remember how much we love life, it's like we invoke the divine and the divine love of life, the divine honouring of life. Sometimes it could be the state of the world that, that um, is challenging 
and it could like bring us to think like what why you know why if there is so much suffering like why you know what are what are we doing or it could be sometimes different things that happen to people different inner pain that people are carrying that that really um bring forth that question of the struggle about life so even at the time of of struggle it's like we can invoke the divine's love of life you know if it feels hard for us to feel it inside ourselves it's like you no know, the divine loves life the sacredness of life a reminder of the sacredness of life the sacredness of existence and for me part of the sacredness is just the many 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 layers of the mystery so it's like we never fully have it we can always learn we can always explore we can always feel more have access to more and and part of also the the challenge or why we might need to evoke invoke the divine that loves life so much is because living a good and basic life can be challenging um and i think a prayer or one of the prayers that i have is if we let the challenges that we have soften us sometimes the challenges harden us and and how can we sort of let the challenges soften us and because part of living you know we can sort of escape um some of some of the challenges through sort of like flying high and bypassing in that way or or also sometimes we can sink too low and and lose that sense of inspiration and spirit and the challenge of really being able to to hold it to to be able to allow spirit and matter to meet inside the body that we are and um and because also um it's like to love sometimes like people complain that they don't feel like alive enough um oh hang on i've just i'm just seeing here that there's a there's a um oh it's a private oh it's someone wrote to me privately a prayer but if with your permission i'd like to read it out so maybe if you could let me know about that um paula keep me posted um okay all right so i'm just going to read this and um thank you for sharing okay hashem shelter me in your peace may my gratitude for plentiful food and a comfortable place to live be with me i am grateful for both my children I'm grateful to comply with lockdown restrictions and as an act of love for my fellow Melburnians. I pray that I remain open to the sunlight of my soul and remain calm and connected to you through inner strength and helping my community through this difficult time. Mm. Amen. Can you hear that song? Thank you. Thank you so much. Paula for sharing that and I invite if there's any other prayers that people want to bring forth I I invite you to bring forth your prayers. Mm. Um okay so um I just wanted to another thing about um Melech Hafetz Bechaim is that that because um to what I was just saying before that that oh yes sometimes people um feel like maybe like things are a bit parav or don't have a taste um or feel like it feels feels a bit dead to life but part of also being alive to life and means also feeling alive to pain and joy and so it's a blessing really about letting whatever we're alive to soften us so that we can like hold ourselves in more gentleness um moving right along um how i'm just can someone give me just a, how much time i have left you have about another eight minutes. Oh, okay, fine, great. Um, so, please also welcome. Not pressure, but if anyone wants to share any prayers or um, questions or comments or how things are resonating for you, I would love to hear that from you. So, we're going through um, the this line of prayer: Zachreinu lechayim, melech hafetz bechayim, vekatfeinu besefer achayim, and write us. In the book of life, I don't know about you, but I never used, I never really liked the whole like writing down the book of life thing. So I think part for me, part of engaging in the tradition is being like a really good translator and um, you know finding like what's the way that, how does um, what the tradition offers me kind of like how can I find a way to let that resonate inside my own being? So you know, even asking ourselves like what is the book of life? 
How do we get inscribed in it? How do we write ourselves in the book of life? There's something about um, responsibility and how it goes with freedom. Um, and like what I was saying before, the book of life, we go back, Rosh Hashanah, it's not just um, the sort of like day of around our life or death. Um, it's also a day, it's the birthday of the world. So, so as I was saying before, the birthday of the world, taking us back to, to our origins, to the purpose, the sacred purpose. And I was in Egypt on a, on a journey. It was called True Power. We went to um, the Oracle of Siwa. It was like an 18-hour bus ride. Usually I hate bus rides. I feel totally nauseous, but it was an amazing experience and we did a big preparation for it. And one of the things that, um, that I, it, um, in my, as well as dreaming of my female ancestors and different um, things that they were carrying and how that got brought forth to me and what my sort of challenges and opportunities were, what, what came to me then was this sense about that we, touch our, that we touch our soul through our humanness and we can't avoid our... And part of that is also our woundedness. Like each one of us has different ways that we've been hurt and we can't fully touch it's and it's hard because it's like it's hard to go to the place of pain but there's something about the power that's that's encased in that pain that allows us to connect to our humanness and through that to our soul um so um yeah connecting to our and also about connecting to our roots like what i was saying before for me it's got to do with australia it's got to do with like feeling connected to Australia, even though I'm here. It's also got to do with our parents. It's like whatever different relationship we have with our parents, there's something about that in the work that I do, which is family constellation work. It's like they say how our parents are our true soulmates in the sense of um, life has been given to us. It's like how part of how we honour life and celebrate life is about how life, um, how life has been given to us. So connecting to our roots and in order to about sustaining our own life. And then we finish this. It's like, um, it's for, for you, um, the living God. So in the same way also, it's like when it feels like we're not sure of the, what the purpose, it's like for the divine and it's not just the divine, it's the living divine. So I'm, I, I want to share a few things about that. Um, also, I, I want to, um, just before, as we're sort of like going on, if anyone's got any prayers or whatever, I really, maybe in a moment we'll take a moment and I'd like you to connect into yourself and see if any prayers emerge. I just want to say something else about Le Mancha, um, Elohim Chaim. So it's for you, the living God. And um, there's something about us that we want to give. It's like, um, there, it's like more painful. There's that statement which is more painful um, than not being able to kind of like take in nourishment. For the, that it's the pain of the mother cow who doesn't have sort of, um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm blank, like who doesn't have calves to like, to, to suckle in the sense we want to give the nature of who we are. We're devotional beings. We want to give. And sometimes that gets all confused and we might give in ways that are too much and then we fall into the martyr or, or all different things like that. But the nature of who we are is that we want to give. Um, you remember like young children, it's like they, something that they love and then, and then before they've learned that they might want to hold on to it, they just want to like give it. It's like, I love this. So I want to give it to you kind of thing and that there is something about our nature and so it's like we we make our lives an offering for the divine and finally in terms of of looking at this line Elohim Chaim like the living God it's the living God it's dynamic so and that's an invitation of like what's alive for us that it's not a static thing every time we come to it something new arises um, and so um, I, I want to, yeah, something new arises and, and an idol is kind of like static, but the living God is dynamic. We're dynamic and the relationship's dynamic. And so this is really um, uh, an invitation to 
to us to keep feeling into like let the shofar well, on the first, on Shabbat there's not going to be a shofar but whether it's the spirit of Shabbat or the shofar to allow that to awaken inside us that that you know what is alive for us now and to be able to bring that as an offering um, so I've got oh, here we've got another um, reflection that I'd like to share before I um, close Sefer reminds us of Sipur, story of life. So may we all merit to play our own special role in the story of life, our own and communally this year. What do we have to contribute individually and together to that story in the year to come? A thought to ponder. Thank you. So I think maybe, um, maybe I'll just give us a moment just before I close, just a moment to take a breath and feel ourself, feel our heart. And yeah, thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Feel free if other prayers, it's so beautiful to hear people's prayers, like please like allow your inner prayer muse to express themselves and um, Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Melanie. That was just wonderful and, you know, picked up so beautifully on this idea of, of creating and writing our own prayers that, uh, that Shoshana spoke about, the idea that uh, we can uh, do that. And, the, and that last contribution with the idea of this being a story, our own story, that we have to own, that we have to understand who we are and in order to be in contact with the divine, the living divine, we've got to somehow connect. It's about connection with ourselves and our roots and whatever else. And I think um, that should very nicely lead us onto our third uh, presenter this evening. And thank you both so far, so, so much for being so uh, wonderful with time. So let me introduce you now to, to Rabbi Dr. Orna Triggerboff, who's been a yoga and meditation teacher for 25 years, 20 years. She trained to become a rabbi with the Jewish Renewal Movement and did a doctorate at Sydney University on Kabbalah. She runs Kabbalah and Jewish meditation classes and even takes people on spiritual tours of Israel. And the next one's going to be in October 2021, if there is such a thing as October 2021 and there are planes that still take us to Israel. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, and she's going to explore with us some Kabbalah and mystical teachings about Rosh Hashanah, letting our souls be nourished in its rich metaphors and symbolic language. And just before I hand it over, I should say that Ona's had a bit of drama tonight coming here. And so I'm sure that she'll be 100% fine, but she's had a, had a little bit of problem with her computer that hopefully is now all solved. So over to you, Ona. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks. So um, welcome, everyone. Good to see you. Um, I, I wanted um, to share with you some Kabbalistic things and I... I just heard, I didn't get to unfortunately hear Shoshana's talk, but heard the end of Melanie's. And so um, hopefully in 2021, we'll come to Jerusalem to learn with you. Um, but uh, you, Melanie, you were talking about um, how Rosh Hashanah is like the birthday of the world and the birthday of humanity. So there's that renewal. And uh, we're going to pick up on that and I've got a, um, a PowerPoint to share, so I might do that and then we can. So, so, of course, this year is different to other years in terms of Rosh Hashanah. And we think about, of course, we can't help but think about the things that we can't do, like um, have the family meal and the, um, all the get together for Tashlich if... Um, if that's something you do. and uh, But what are some of the things we can do? So I was thinking about um, uh, reading. We can read books that nourish our soul. And I must say at this um, time where emotions are heightened and people can feel anxious, I've found that reading some of these commentary books on Torah and commentaries on the spiritual meaning or the 
personal meaning of the high holidays before I go to sleep. I know it's just really helped me sleep better. So I wanted to give that as a suggestion. And also other things we can do is just walking in nature and um, getting that sense of Rosh Hashanah as a time to connect with nature and with and with that essence within us. And then also on Rosh Hashanah, we can still do Tashlich, even if we can't go into synagogues and confined spaces, we can still go, if you've got a kind of um, a water, a body of water near you, it will be a great idea to go and do Tashlich where on Rosh Hashanah in the afternoon, but it can also be done during the 10 days of Or or on Yom Kippur to just um, have some time to connect with what your hopes are for the year to come and, and throw those grains of rice or pieces of bread, whatever your custom is, into the water. And then... Um, the idea of that this being a period of teshuva, of repentance, leading up to Rosh Hashanah and then again leading up to Yom Kippur. One of the ways of looking at teshuva is that it's a soul, a period of soul accounting where we look at the positives and the negatives. So I know some people really hone in on the negatives and what have I done wrong and what, what do I need to say sorry for and all that. But I was really, when I was thinking about our session today and especially the people in Melbourne who are um, much more isolated, um, it, it may be it's a time not necessarily to go that much into the negative but to focus more on what's been going well in the last year. What can be continued? What do I want to continue with in the year to come because it went well in the year gone by? And what can I strengthen? And what can I build on in terms of the things that been, have been going well for you? And just uh, seeing it possibly as a time to be kind to yourself and to build on, build on the good things that have been happening And this uh, tie, it's going to tie in by the end to the idea, the Midrashic idea that Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, um, some Midrashim say that it's the birthday of the creation of, the, um, of humanity and some say the creation, a birthday of the creation of the world. So it's either one of those different Midrashim, but... Whichever it is, it's this time of a renewal of hope and being open to change and open to the possibility of change. And we think of also not only the Jewish teachings, but even in, um, in uh, new neurology, they talk about how there's, we always used to think that our neurons, our brain cells and nerve, nerve cells were um, it was not possible to change them. Once there was damage in the brain, that was it. And just in the last few years, it's become more and more accepted that there is neuroplasticity and possibility to change and when there's damage somewhere to regenerate. And so at this, and so who knows what other kinds of things we've taken for granted that can't be changed that um, that really can be changed. And so when we think about the words Rosh Hashanah, the word Shana means year, but it also means change, like Leshanot, to change. And so you might think of it as a year where change is possible. And um, this time... Uh, this time of Elul, so we've got two more weeks of Elul, two and a bit, um, is in the lead up 
to Rosh Hashanah can be seen as a time where it's like we're in a cocoon and we're kind of waiting to be born as butterflies on Rosh Hashanah. And, and this ties in with a Kabbalistic teaching about the Shekhinah. So the Shekhinah is the divine presence and it's also the divine feminine. So it's seen as the divine um, the aspect, the feminine aspect of the divine. And in Kabbalistic terminology, there's the earthly Shrina and the heavenly Shrina. And the earthly Shrina, we could see it as Mother Earth the, and the divine presence within everything in the material world. So that idea that every single person has a divine spark within them. And then there's, so there's the Shrina, that's the earthly mother. And then there's the heavenly divine mother, Shrina. And this is the one where in Kabbalistic mythology, um, we, it talks about how when we do tshuva, that soul work of self-improvement, our soul rises to the level of this divine heavenly mother. And it's like our soul is bathed and cleansed in a heavenly ocean. And so the Kabbalist, the Zohar, the 13th century Kabbalistic text, talks about how our soul rises up when we do tshuva and it enters into this, this massive heavenly ocean which uh, receives us, no matter who or what we are, it receives us and it washes our soul and it just reminds it's very in that way it's kind of similar to the image um, and the mythology of venus where venus every morning goes into the ocean and she becomes a virgin again she becomes totally new and so it's that idea that when our souls are reborn out of this time of tshuva it's like we're, we're fresh and, and ready for a new start. And so um, it's also called, it's described as if we're held in the womb of the Shrina, so a, a heavenly womb that we're resting in while we're doing that work of soul accounting. And then on Rosh Hashanah, our soul is born out of the divine ocean and we um, we kind of and then we have a new start, but having done that work, and I just want to bring also this image from Chagall. And then if we look at a teaching from the Svat Emet, who was a Hasidic Rebbe from the 18th century, the Alter Rebbe of Ger. He talks about how Rosh Hashanah is a revealing of the inner light of the heart, um, which is like an inner spring of water, of fresh water. And um, he asks, why on Rosh Hashanah do we say, Katvenu lechayim, inscribe us for life? And he talks about how each person has an inner point of light in the heart, a nekuda pnimit. And it's also known as our Nishmat Chayim, our living soul. <clears throat> and that it's also called the eternal life that's implanted within us. Within us. Chaye Olam Shinata Betochenu, which is part of the Torah blessings. And then that's also connected to the idea of Lev Tahor, a pure heart from the Psalms. And that um, the Svat Emet goes on to teach that over the year, we, any time we act in a, with negative behaviours, it's like there's a spiritual muck 
that covers the light of the heart. And then when we do the process of teshuva, we start removing that muck from the light of the heart and then the heart can shine again. And that every year this renewal is actually that whole process of removing the muck and revealing the light of the heart is being inscribed for life, katvenu lachayim. And that he says this process continues till the end of Yom Kippur, which is Ne'ila. And Ne'ila actually is called the Khatima or the sealing of life. And you know, one of the greetings for this time of year is Gemar Khatima Tova, may you be sealed for a life in a good way, may, may you be sealed in the book of life. And this, what is this idea of sealing? And um, so the Svat Emetz talks about how when we get rid of the muck and our life force and the light in our heart starts to shine again or even more brightly, then what happens is we actually need to protect that precious light and we need to direct it or in, in um, those terms of the prayers, we need to seal that light so it's controlled and it doesn't get lost um, in directions that aren't good. And so he talks about these words from the Song of Songs, the most famous Jewish love song in the Bible. And it says, um, it says that there is a, a secret garden, a gan na'ul, and a sealed fountain, a mayan chatum, and so he, connect, he compares the light of the heart and especially that light that we get renewed on Rosh Hashanah as being like a, a precious secret garden and a sealed fountain connected to our life force. And um, so now I, I just I wanted to give us a chance to do a group sharing um, and this is in Zoom, there's this opportunity to go into separate breakout rooms. And of course, I'm going to, we'll be in groups of around six or seven. And if you don't feel like sharing, you don't have to. It's only if you want to. But in these times of a bit more isolation than we'd like, it can be a really nice thing to, to share together. And so I wanted to offer you to share what are three things that you've been doing that promotes a feeling of well-being during this COVID time? So that's one question. Another one, what's something you're looking forward to in the year ahead? And the next one, what does renewal mean to you as Rosh Hashanah approaches? So you can choose any of those questions and I invite you to um, to share to um, to go into those breakout rooms that I think um, I've created okay. so I will now send you to the breakout rooms and you just have five minutes so please feel free to share and discuss so that we can talk when we all return Hope you had a chance to share there while you were in your rooms. Everyone's slowly rejoining us. They're definitely still talking in one of the rooms because I can hear it from the other room in my house. Welcome back. Still waiting for a few more people to return. And I'll hand back to Orna. Is everyone back? No, we've still got a few people. We're waiting to come back. They should all be back. 
So I'll hand back over to you, Orna. Oh, okay. Well, um, welcome back, everyone. Um, I wanted to invite people to share um, something that you wanted to share from your sharing group. So feel free to either unmute yourself or type in the chat box. Our group spoke about reconnecting with nature. Some of, some of us, it was very heartfelt, reconnected with her mother who was, who, who was you know, quite old. Um, so um, reconnecting and letting the breeze and the sun blow through your hair, reconnecting with um, reading parts of the Torah, with listening to Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. So we had quite a few really um, both spiritual and, and nature mm. experiences, which were really nice. Mm. Wow. Thank you. Uh, I've been benefiting from some gym routines online as well. <laughs> I set up my little iPad on the table and I do exercises. Wonderful, Bernice. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? That's great because, honestly, these sharing circles can really inspire us to do things we haven't thought of. Mm. Yeah. I, go, I go up on the, on the, on the shoreline. I... I Take a walk. Sometimes I, I lose myself, and I and, and I walk for about twelve k's, and I'm thinking, "Oh my God, where am I? Who am I? Which way is up?" <laughs> but it's it's so good. It's it's sort of um, it 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 has it has that um, cathartic experience after you've walked mm -hmm. you've, you've been walking for a while. You you go into a different zone, <laughs> mm -hmm. especially yeah, yeah. in the wind and the wind and the sun and the birds singing and the. Mm. Whistling. <laughs> it's good. Yes, I've noticed that there's more bird life now that the aeroplanes have stopped flying so much. Beautiful. It's such a pleasure to, to hear birds singing. Hmm. Amazing. Um, one more comment? I think being socially connected is important, even if it's keeping in touch with friends by telephone. I do quite a lot of that. Yeah. Um, I've noticed that a lot of people have got a COVID pet um, to keep them company. It's, mm. rather, it's um, rather nice because I've got a number of children in primary school. Um, almost every week, um, at least one of them at show and tell, has a there's a new puppy to go look puppy or kitten to go look on the screen so someone got rabbits one person got a new baby brother but um mostly it's been puppies and um <laughs> rabbits yes nice um well so i think um what we're going to do is um we're going to um we're going to have an informal hangout for it for 10 or 15 minutes after this. So I just want to, before we kind of formally finish, want to um, wish everyone a, a happy Shana Tova and with a sweet, joyful, inspiring, meaningful, successful year ahead. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank, you, so, thank you so much. Before we finish, um, I, I, I want to say a couple of things. First of all, there are just so many things that came out of tonight of the different sessions, uh, including the things that we shared with each other. But I really would like to ask all of you to take the thoughts away with you, to think about the prayers that other people have used, to think about the prayers that we might create, to think about the ways in which you can do Teshuva to renew your soul. To take these things seriously and there are so many different ways in which we can touch base with ourselves and we've talked about it through a naturalistic process but also through the things that Judaism has to offer us 
whether that is through doing tashlif if you've ne never done it before, and that's when you take your breadcrumbs to the ocean and you throw away your sins, you cast out your sins into the ocean, and from that you are refreshed and renewed just by doing that process. And there are so many different things. You can't necessarily hear a shofar on Rosh Hashanah, but you know, a Rosh Hashanah, a shofar sound is quite an amazing thing. Mm -hmm. It touches my soul always to hear the shofar, even when my grandsons are doing a terrible job of practicing and uh, they're, mm -hmm. but th that they're not quite there yet. But please take the opportunity, recognize that this is the time of year where you can just stop what you're doing and take time out to go online and find a shofar and listen to it and think about what it is you can do. Now, of course, National Council of Jewish Women has, uh, is renewing itself and it's looking at all sorts of new ways for people to become involved. One of the things you can do in the new year is think about a, d a different action you can take in the community. And so feel free to be involved in contact with us because there are lots of places for people to do things. But also be in touch, stay in touch, stay involved. Join our Facebook group where there's a place for conversation and join with your friends and take uh, nourishment from each other. Take the lessons we've had tonight and take those into your heart and spend the time and nurture yourself with those things. Before I formally close, I want to tell you that we're going to have in a minute put into the chat the details of our next two uh, webinars. The first one, uh, the next one coming up is with uh, uh, Rabbanit Yehudit Levitin and Rabbanit Elise Borgi, who are going to talk about being Orthodox Jewish women and taking smicha and what that means for them. And then we're going to do something quite different and something that we've never done before, certainly at a national level, and that's we're going to learn how to cook. We're going to uh, have someone teaching us how to make a honey cake. And the reason wow. I'm saying to you, even if you're a good cook, you should come along because this will be a gift to yourself that you will make or a gift for someone else. If there aren't enough people where you live, if you're in lockdown, to eat the honey cake yourself, I'm sure there is some neighbour where that they could really enjoy the gift of a sweet new year that you could pass on to them. So please join us at future events. I would like to thank, first of all, our speakers, um, all, all three of them have been absolutely wonderful. So if you could join me in a Zoom yeah. uh, 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 muzzle tov and congratulations and thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts. I also want to thank two other people who are absolutely essential in making this happen. The first is Debbie Clute, who is hiding somewhere, who is uh, one of the people behind the scenes that makes things happen at National Council Jewish Women of Australia in the national body. And the other is Danielle jones Resnick, who is our Zoom master and has again done a fabulous job tonight. So thank you, Debbie, and thank you, Danielle. Okay, so now I'm saying good night. Uh, I'm going to stay online though. And everybody is welcome to, to go because we've finished the formal procedures or to stay around and to chat with each other. And good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night.